This month, as part of our art focus on abstraction, we're talking about value. Value is defined as the lightness or the darkness of a color. Here you see a gray wheel that I painted and each of the color or each of the grays on this represents a gray on that continuum from white to black, which is how we get the gray. We add white to a color to make a tint. We add gray to a color in order to make what we call a tone. We add black to a color in order to create what we call a shade. Note that these are the official quote unquote ways that we, words that we use to refer to colors that have white or gray or black added to them. And so when we talk about the shade of a color, we're actually sort of confusing things and muddying the waters because specifically in this world of terminology, a shade means specifically black. Now, one way that artists work with value is to translate their work into a, a gray painting or a gray version. Here you see the Richard Diebenkorn translated into a gray or actually really just a black and white photograph version of his painting. And you can see from this that he used a very narrow value range. That means that the colors were very similar in value to each other. And so the painting is not a particularly dramatic painting. That doesn't mean it isn't a beautiful painting, but it's not very high contrast. I took the liberty of turning some of the pieces that I shared with you early in the year when I talked to you about how abstraction unfolded as an art form. Um, you saw some of these paintings then. Now I've turned them into grayscales so that we can look at how important value is in the, the use of the colors here. So in this particular painting from Hilma F. Clint, you see in the grayed version that there's really quite a range of value in the painting. And so using the term value doesn't necessarily mean that the painting or the piece of artwork, whether it be stitching or quilting, no matter what it is, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a piece of artwork that is all gray, white and black. It just means that we add different amounts of white and gray and black to colors in order to create colors that have different relative values and that that can make a piece more interesting or dynamic. So here we have this Kandinsky, which we've looked at before, and now we have a version of it done with the gray scale. And you can see there's quite a bit of action even in the gray version of it, which translates of course into the colors on the left-hand side. Uh, why would someone do this? Because color is really important to composition and important to works of all kinds, whether they're figurative or abstract, but the values that are used are equally important, if not sometimes thought to be more important because of how value implies depth and creates its own kind of contrast that can uh, reference more than just the two dimensions. Another Kandinsky, in this case, lower value contrast, as we can see when we look at the grayscale version of it. So when you take the color away, you have a really great opportunity to study composition and to see how the various parts are interacting with each other because you don't any longer have the color as um, a distraction. Now, this is an interesting one to turn into the grayscale because it's not all that different in the grayscale version because the colors that Picasso used on the left are very, very uh, light, low value colors. And so there's not a lot of intensity in a piece like this or contrast. The interest in the piece comes from the shapes and the forms and the, the sort of storyline or the narrative 
of the piece as much as it has anything to do with the color palette that Picasso chose. But you can also see from just these few examples that choosing a low value uh, color combination in the way that this painting reflects um, sets a, a tone that's a very calm tone uh, and not nearly as high energy as perhaps the Kandinsky that we saw just a moment ago. Of course, Mondrian was known for reducing composition to a series of flat planes, rectangles, and squares as a way of getting to what he thought of as the elemental composition. And here you get a very clear sense of how relative colors are in terms of value because the yellow in the uh, left-hand side painting doesn't really look very much different at all from the white and the very slightly, slightly grayed rectangles in this piece, whereas the dark blue and the red uh, are perceived as much darker values when they're translated into the grayscale. Rothko's paintings present a real challenge because what is making these paintings sing in the way that they do is the fact that he layered these sheer layers of, of oil color over each other, which uh, created a surface that was very luminescent. But when you turn it into a grayscale, you don't really have a sense of that at all. And so that's only proving the point of Rothko's remarkable ability as a colorist to create these color fields that uh, seem to vibrate against each other. Slightly more contrast in this one, but again, it's a rather quiet palette, quiet palette value-wise, and um, sets up a relatively soft and luminous glow that would not be anything to appreciate at all without the, without the color, frankly. And the same thing, one more time with the compliments on the left. Ms. Frankenthaler, you see there is quite a bit of value contrast. Uh, of course, if we're looking at this from a color standpoint, this is basically a, a painting that uses complementary colors of that grayed down blue and the grayed down orange. And then just those teeny little spots of orange that are the, the focal point where your eye goes. If you look at the gray version of it, those don't become very significant at all. And so it's an interesting way to analyze the form, even in this abstract painting that doesn't have anything that you might think of as recognizable. So it still is energetic, partly because of the value transitions and the value contrasts. So what we learn from looking at these is that the value is important because it's giving um, in this particular case, it's giving form and dimension to the parts of the painting so that it doesn't look flat, it looks dimensional. Um, that's one of the roles that the values are playing, as well as creating some interest in contrast uh, with the lights and the darks. Now, one thing that is sometimes recommended is to get a piece of clear red acrylic or film, I think they even sell a tool like this, and you can use that to look through anything you're creating in color in order to translate it into a value study like the one you'd see on the right here. And why is that useful? It's useful because it gives you a sense of whether all the values you're using are too close together, which might actually be creating a, a surface that's not as interesting as it might otherwise be. That's really what we're after here, is to see how the contrasts of the values can make the surface more interesting. Masterful piece by Betty Busby. And you really get a sense of how she's created that glow in the center of the quilt on the left when you look at the gray version of it, because you can see there's a lot of lightness around the center here, a lot of value contrast in here. That's what's happening, that's, that is making what's happening on the left happen in terms of that glow at the center of the piece. Interesting piece from Maria Schell. She's a master of this particular approach to piecing. And I always found this particular quilt interesting because if you look at the colors, how the blue goes black, uh, 
and there again, and how the dark purple tends to go really, really dark gray as well. Susan Buckingham, um, I didn't put any little arrows on this, but it's a beautiful piece she shared last month. And it's another example of how, uh, if, if you've never noticed or have not used this sort of an exercise, it's a really great way to figure out whether you've got enough contrast happening in the piece from a value standpoint. And if you look at, at this piece, for example, this dark uh, teal, teal blue bar here with the little red squares, and then you look over here at how that's contrasted, you get a really great sense from looking at a piece like this of what the relative values of the colors are um, in relation to each other. Now, one of the ways to become more aware of value is to participate in the creative eye, of course, and part of being in the creative eye, whether you actually post or not, this particular month, if we start looking for textures and we start looking for compositions that are essentially value studies, it's a great way to start thinking about how they might be incorporated into your work. And so here are a few of my own. And it might be a really interesting exercise this particular month to take an image like this image and translate it into a version in color that would literally uh, try to mimic the values that are here. And so this center triangle would be the brightest color. This might be a bright orange. And then this would be the, the next light, I guess up here, this, this rectangle would be the next lightest orange. And then I'd start adding a little bit of gray to it in order to create this plane and the plane down below, and then even more gray to create this shape that surrounds the uh, triangle on two sides, and then go with a very, uh, maybe even a shade by adding enough black to the orange to get some, a shape that, or a color that was high contrast enough that I could put it in this, um, this, this uh, triangle right here, this inverted triangle on the right. So you could play with color and value that way in order to really begin to refine your sense of how to mix the values and use them from a paint perspective. And then I'm closing with a few pieces that are from a series that I did in, uh, I think, 20, 2008, maybe. In any event, there were 40 pieces. And the challenge that I set myself, they ranged from being 12 to 14 inches tall and 30 to 36 inches wide. Uh, I started with, I, I decided that the entire series would feature white and gray and black, and I would eliminate the color in order to focus on the textures and the patterns that I was creating. So they are uh, mixed media, mainly textile pieces over a felt backing. And so you see here flower paste resist. And essentially what I did with the series was to start by dyeing all of the fabric gray. I do five or six pieces at a time each week. But if you've never worked in a really quiet A, typical palette like this, or achromatic, which means without color. Of course, there's some color in this. There's the beige of the paper pattern, and there's a gray here. This, this um, old tuxedo shirt was dyed in a gray dye that had kind of a green cast to it. So sometimes there are hints of color, but if you've never worked with a very limited palette in this way, it's a very interesting way to refine your design sensibility and your compositional skills once again, because you're not being distracted by color. So this is a close-up of a piece that was rice paper and black sand over silk that had been dyed and then flower pasted with India ink. So those are a few examples to get you started thinking about abstraction 
and the important role that value plays. And I hope that you will expand upon this by completing some of the exercises that I've suggested and getting out that phone and taking some pictures. I look forward to seeing what you're creating and to seeing some of what you do on the Facebook page.